10, 9, ignition sequence start. All engines are running. Lift off! Lift off! The clock is operating. We're on our way. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And as we lay on the ground, abused and humiliated, it is time once again for KerbalCast, episode 36, Fifty Shades of Eve. Oh my. Oh my, my, my. I am your... (laughs) I knew you'd like that. I am your LMP, Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin, and in the Command Module Pilot seat today, our CMP... Nostromo. Say that again. Nostromo. Okay, a little bit softer now. Nostromo. A little bit louder now. Nostromo. A little bit faster now. Nostromo. There you go. Do you know who? Do you know who is uh, is very happy that you're back? Who? Amy. Oh yeah. Amy K sat in on the program last week. Yeah, I listened. It was great. Yeah, Amy did a great job. But I I think that poor Amy probably felt like she was locked in a room with a lunatic for two <laughs> hours. You know, because yeah. it was just... Yeah, see, I've been in the asylum for six months now. Yeah, so. yeah. So, but see, you're used to it. Yeah. You're used to it. But poor Amy <laughs> just like a, suffered like, right through it's it. It's like a bad smell. Eventually, you don't know who dealt it. It's just there. <laughs> and you get used to it yeah. after a while. And, then, you know, it just seeps into your clothes, and you just... Yeah, you just absolutely. Live well, welcome back, man. I know you have been traveling a lot. Yeah, my job is like... Pretty much, so far, it's yeah. been 100% travel. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, um, we, we did a poll um, of our listeners, and we've all agreed we don't like your new job, and we want you to get a different one. Oh, again? So, yeah. Again, i got to get it. Oh. <laughs> Go get another one. I hear Burger King is hiring. Oh, yeah. If I could, if I could have it my way, then Yeah, yeah there well, we there you go. Have it your way. Okay. Uh, what's coming up in today's program? Blow me up, crash me down, it's our progress or lack thereof in the game. And your letters, the latest Kerbal news in the mission briefing. Another episode of A Kerbal Life by Amy K. Amy K. And calling all modders, North Star needs your help. An update on an update. Harvester tells us what to expect from update 1.0. And we have an audio letter from Thomas Eccles, who is a birthday boy this week. Hey! So we have to, we have to say happy birthday to him. Well, um, have you? Did you get a chance to do any progress in the game? Because you've told me before that when you're on the road, yeah, I, you don't have access. See, I don't even have a smartphone or right, anything, so right. I go pretty much four days, uh, you know, with nothing. So, back, back to caveman yeah. existence. And so I spend like the whole day I come back like responding to all the emails that I have, which is You're I, like, I don't understand yeah. this fancy Wi Fi which, stuff. Which it makes me feel important because day to day I would get one email, but right, whenever I come right. back from being gone for like four or five days, I have two. And so it's really cool. I'm like, whoa, I'm you know, Mr. Popular. I am Mr. Popular. Yeah. So it's a it's it's been an adventure. Yeah. So I did get some playing this week. Okay. And I started trying to play on that same campaign file mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I had before. You know, the one where I had, you know, a bunch of loving little Nick picks about, right. you right. know, the current state of the game. Well, even though it was against what I personally wanted to do, mm-hmm. I deleted that file and started the new one. Because I think in, in any simulation, or most simulation games, or any game really, your save file, like, you should be able to somewhat recoup in an open world kind of game. Right. But the way it was is I can't sell those buildings, mm-hmm. or at least I didn't mm-hmm. see a way to. I mean, maybe I missed a big glowing button, but um, there were just not many ways that I could uh, bounce back from where I was without doing a bunch of little smart, small parts testing. Well, the the problem that I run into a long time, uh, a lot of times with games, and Civilization is real bad as far as this one goes. Mm-hmm. If you step away from game uh, certain types of games for a couple of days, yeah. Sometimes when you come back to them, it's like, um, oh, I've got a ship in orbit over here, and I've got this other thing over here. Yeah. Or with Civilization, it was always, oh, I got a unit way, you know, over here. I wonder what he was doing. I yeah, and remember. it's like, oh, I have a navy. I didn't know I had <laughs> oh, a navy. I wonder how that sprung. Yeah. Up. So I I understand the whole restarting bit. Yeah. So I just decided to restart, and you know, um based on some of the pieces of advice from some of the list from some of the listeners and their letters about how to uh, make it in this campaign mode um, I started taking I started taking on that advice mm-hmm. so I started off with my money and I didn't upgrade the administration building you know I got I got what will get me the most money and eventually I was doing small contracts and then getting um, 
you know, upgrading my launch pad so it could actually handle more weight. So those 30 part ships actually could have, you know, some size to them. Right. Well, um, the other thing I remembered is when you start off, it says get a, a vessel above 5,000 meters. Mm-hmm. And everyone said, once you get to 5,000 meters, stop. Right. Because then you'll open up an 1,100 mm-hmm. or an 11,000 meter, and then you'll open up a like a 24. Or yeah, 50. it's like, I think, isn't it like, uh, isn't it a series of 11s? It's like 11, 22, 33. Four, I, I, yeah, I think, not, isn't it like, like that? that. Isn't yeah. it staggered by 11s? Yeah, and so I was like, okay, well, I need to do that. I build, I haven't unlocked anything, mm-hmm. no science tree or anything. And um, the the reason why they said to do that is because if you pass it, let's say I go, you know, I pass that 5,000 meter, but in that same launch, mm-hmm. I go beyond uh, 22,000 uh, right. meters. Right. Well, that means those contracts will never show up. Mm-hmm. And they give you a de- pretty decent amount of money for something that's, pretty relatively easy to achieve i mean you could achieve it with the base stuff which is where it leads me here i made it was a command pod Mm -hmm. two of the i think it's lv 100s or something it's like the the base fuel cell right that you have at the beginning like the only one you have Mm -hmm. two of those and then um just yeah because it doesn't doesn't it start you out you've got a capsule you've got a fuel tank you've got one engine and uh you've got one booster yeah and no way to connect them, if I remember right. Uh, there's no decouplers yeah. or anything. So it's like no. you just kind of stack those things up. I think right. you have girders right. and a parachute. Okay. So I, you know. Can't forget the parachute. Yeah, I can't forget the parachute. <laughs> so this was, this was the, the ship that I built. And if I remember right, this was the kind of ship that I built the very first time I launched when I first started the game, you know, six plus months ago. Mm-hmm. It was a command, a parachute, command pod, like starting from the top down. Um, one or two of those fuel cells or like the fuel cans and then the one engine that you had. Mm -hmm. And so the one that I built had two of those fuel cells in the engine. I launch it off of it. I pass the 5,000 mark and I have to flip the thing upside down and push the other way. Oh yeah. In order to not go higher. Right. So I was like, wait, how high would I go just off this base of a thing? And Mm -hmm. it went over the 11,000 mark. Mm Mm-hmm. Which means a player who didn't know this would never find that contract if they were yeah. just like, okay, I need to build a thing and go as high as I can, boom. You know, to me, that is absolutely the antithesis of what I play Kerbal for. Yeah. You know, the idea that that you are literally trying to prevent yourself from going higher. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, it's like the higher I go, it's like, oh, I could go that high? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it's so... I. I if I wouldn't have known that, yeah. I would have thought I just, hey, I went pretty high and I got a contract, yeah. and the next contract would have been twenty two thousand. <laughs> I just had a bad thought. Kerbal is the it's the equivalent of that girl that tells you she just wants to take things slow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like uh, I'm not ready for that contract just yet. Yeah, I wanted to build a cool rocket. Yeah, and so I built a cool rocket, and apparently I wasn't restricting myself enough. If maybe it would have done one fuel cell, it may I may have done it. But I, I did two just because it's, hey, it's two, you know, mm-hmm. and I, it's not super expensive. I can afford it. But I had already, if I wouldn't have known mm-hmm. this thing that was told to me by other players, yeah. like I would, like that I would not have found out in a bubble. If I didn't know that, I would have already passed a contract that could have gotten me the money to help me unlock a building. So it's just, it's, I know I've been going on this for a while. I think yeah. we're like three or four podcasts of me complaining about this update. Yeah. But yeah, but you're not. I mean, you say that like you're the only one. Yeah, I mean, so, we hear it a lot. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. At least for this episode, yeah. this is the last. This is the last of the complaints I have. But something like that is very. Um, it's it's kind of like withholding mm-hmm. to a player who would who would try to find this and play it on their own because that's the kind of player that I am. Right. I want to try to find it and play it on my own. I won't read a tutorial before I start playing any game. Mm-hmm. I want to get out there and find out how to do it, and. I would have never have known that I did something wrong Mm -hmm. and I didn't even really do anything wrong. I did what the game is for. I launched, I launched a cool rocket into the air. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to quibble with your use of the word wrong. Yeah. But I cut myself off from funds that would help me in the early game, which is the most restrictive part of the game Mm -hmm. is in the early game. It's real restrictive because you have to watch how you spend your money. Cause if you don't do it right, you won't have access to the stuff to help you get the money to get out of that, Mm -hmm. you know, living you know paycheck to paycheck yeah. pretty much in, in Kerbal. so beyond that 
my progress mm -hmm. has been, um, I've been doing a lot of parts contracts and I've just been declining any of them that just don't look easy, feasible or high payoff. So until I get the ones that I want and I'm gradually getting money to where I can get a runway and the, uh, science and everything to build space planes and use those to get the, um, explore Kerbin contracts. Mm -hmm. Right. It looks like those will be the ones I can get the most bang for my, for my buck at the very beginning okay. off of some cheap planes. Okay. So, so that's, that's been most of my progress in the game. So, I mean, I still have things that I'm vocal about yeah. that I'm just not wild about in the game so far. But, I mean, it is a game that is in development. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll, even if it, there aren't new features done, there may just be a rebalancing of right. features, which and, would be fine. And that's the indication I get from from the little tidbits they put out. It sounds like, you know, okay, we put it all out there. Now now we're working on balancing. Yeah. So, so it's like it's all those features are yeah. here to stay, but the way the features are defined may be different. Yeah. So the impossibly expensive VAB building could be upgraded mm -hmm. for a far more reasonable cost. You mentioned um, the uh, the community aspect of Kerbal. You can view that as a plus or a minus, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to play the game. I can say, and I have said, that the Kerbal player that I am today is because we've got a whole host of listeners out there that write us in and go, hey, guys, did you know that blank? Yeah. And there's so many things that I probably would have, I'm sure I would have found them eventually, but the progress that I've made over, say, the past six months um, because of the community has been far and above what I think I would have done as an, inv an individual player. Mm -hmm. Now, someone, so one player may look at that and go, that's a real positive. And then somebody else may look at it and go, that's a real negative. Yeah. You know, if I have to have like the whole community telling me what to do, that's a negative. But another player would go, hey, I've got this whole community telling me what to do. That's a positive. Yeah, see, I'm in the former because I should not, unless it is a game that right up front tells me, um, yeah. use the community in order mm -hmm. to, like, there's some games that are fueled off of crap. So, like, mm -hmm. there's an online browser game called Cursors right. where you move your little mouse through this, these mazes and you have to click buttons to open doors for other people. Well, you need other people to pass through that game. Mm -hmm. But in a game like this, I mean, unless they say, hey, you're not going to really do that well mm -hmm. if you don't get help from everyone around you and basically look at to a community to tell you how to play the game you bought. Right. To me, anytime I buy a game, it's an isolated thing. It's my game. I'm going to play my game. And I'll play it. I'll play single or multiplayer, whatever. And then whenever I've reached a certain point to where I want to be better at the game than I currently am, then I'll look to other people to see what they've done. But I should not have to do that from the get go, yeah. like from the very start, like, Hey, Hey, how do I play this game? You know, do you remember, and I'm, I'm going to need your help on this one. Cause the title has escaped me. I think it's dark souls, but I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure. Do you remember there was a game that was so difficult mm -hmm. and they had it set up to where when you died, you could leave a message yeah, like for next other person. players. Yeah. And you know, and, and the game was, I mean, it was, it was advertised as being, this is a nearly impossible game to play. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go through basically everybody's death notes to get through this game. Yeah. And and I remember when I when I heard it described to me, I thought that's my definition of hell right there. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound like fun. But I know that there were players that, you know, man, that was the game. You know, that was the game they had to play cuz it was so impossible. Mhm. Mm and they just, they loved it. They loved the challenge. Yeah, it is, it is Dark Souls, by the it way. It is a Dark yeah, Souls? Yeah, it okay. is Dark Souls. Uh, well, I knew, I, I was I was bouncing between Dark Souls and Dark, Dark Siders, but I knew it wasn't Dark Siders, because <laughs> Dark yeah. Siders was more of an action game. This or, was or more... Or beverage. Yeah, so. yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so... A dark Ale. Yeah, Dark Ale. <laughs> so, with Dark Souls, it was in the game. Yeah. That's the difference. Right, it was in, right. The game itself was mm -hmm. other people are going to help you, and the interface of the game was here. Here's how you help other people. Yeah. But with something like uh, a lot of simulation games, uh, Kerbal, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, being what we're doing a podcast about, um, <laughs> you have to go like you can't do that in the game. You mm -hmm. have to open up a browser window and search and read forums right, and right, see all these right. varying opinions on the best way to do a oh, rendezvous. That's a good point. I didn't think of it that way, but that's a very good point. Yeah. So it's not part of the game. Yeah. It's part of 
Like you have to go do another activity yeah. to understand you have this to alt activity. tab and actually get out of the game. Yeah. And you, you have know. to, and then you have to read all these varying opinions out on how to best rendezvous. Mm. And that's okay. That is okay. Right. That is completely okay. That, I mean, that's the reason we're doing a podcast yeah. is because of a community. Mm-hmm. It's perfectly fine. But I mean, think of a new player who walks in and you're like, Hey, um, before you start, you're going to want to watch these couple mm. videos, read these few things. Right. Uh, otherwise you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wild about that front end being loaded onto, yeah. Hey, that game you bought on the steam sale, you got to do your homework. Yeah. You know, you can't just walk in and, you know, mill around and do okay. You're eventually going to feel like you're stuck. Yeah. Which that's what happened in my previous save file. I just deleted mm-hmm. is it was like, wow, I made one or two bad moves and I didn't even think they were bad moves. Yeah. Well, I know one of the uh, the the Matrix sequels. Uh, one of the complaints that that people were leveling at those was, you know, you could watch part two and part three and get the story, mm-hmm. but there was also it's like, yeah, there's this graphic novel that you can read that's going to tell you something you don't know in the movies, and then there's these video games that you can play that'll tell you something you don't know, and there's yeah. these other things. And there were people that were complaining, going, you know, good lord, I shouldn't have to do six different media properties just to get the whole story. Yeah. You know, I should be able to get it from the movie. Yeah. It's like you can get the entire story of dead space Mm -hmm. from the game. Right. Like I get the gist of the story. I understand every now, if I want to know more, Mm -hmm. I can go back a little bit and there's an animated movie. Yeah. If I want to know even more, there was a six issue comic book that happened before that. Mm -hmm. So I could read, if I wanted to know everything, I would read the comics and watch the movie and play the game. But if somebody just walked in like, I just want to play this game, right. you're fine. Go ahead. Do that. Well, it's the, um, if, if you'll go online and look at like the Star Trek and the Star Wars forums, inevitably somebody will go, yeah, but in this novel, mm-hmm. something, something, and someone else will go, you know, no, no, don't give me the expanded universe stuff. You know, the movies are the story. Yeah. You know, yes, the books and everything else expands, but the movies are the story. Yeah. But, you know, the, the nice thing about Kerbal is, is that I, I, I can't say for certain that I know this, but for example, do you remember when we were asked a long time ago, they said, how do you launch? And do you remember you and I both basically said the same thing? We come straight off the ground until we get into space, mm-hmm. until we, you know, until yeah. we leave the atmosphere and then we flip over 90 degrees and we, and we burn. And we got this cascade of letters going, no, that is a huge waste of fuel. Mm-hmm. I think eventually I would have figured out, you know, oh, I'm in a, you know, the atmosphere gets thinner at this point and yeah. now I can start to lean and okay, now the atmosphere is even thinner and I can lean even more. I think I would have figured that out. I would, uh, please, I hope, Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know that I would have figured it out as soon as I did. And I guess technically that doesn't count as figuring it out and having someone else tell you, <laughs> but I don't know that I would have figured it out, um, as quickly as I did. Uh, I may be, I mean, to this day, I may still be going straight off the ground and, you know, getting up into the atmosphere going, I'm the best curbler there ever was. Yeah. Yeah. See, see, you were, you were still able to play the game. Yeah. And I mean, you weren't playing it the most efficient way. And, Mm -hmm. you know, eventually you wanted to find out, hey, how do other people do it? Right. And so you found out. Right. Could you have kept playing the game? Sure. Doing that? Oh, yeah. 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 The difference is, um, I think some of the things that I have been able to accomplish since, you know, you know, I've said this many, many times going back uh, over the previous podcast. One of the things I like about Kerbal is the more you do, the more you can do. Mm hmm. And I think that something as simple as efficient launching puts you in orbit with enough fuel to do more. Yeah. Um, learning how to rendezvous gives you options that you never had. Learning how to transfer from one planetary system to another gives you options that you never had. And the sooner you learn those things, the more the game opens up to you. So again, I go back to what I said earlier. You can read that as a plus. You can read that as a minus. And I think that I think a lot of that goes to your individual play style. Yeah. So, did you hear the dog? Yeah. My dog barked. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is the co-host for the yeah. week. Yeah. There we go. She's the other co-host. Yeah. He, so um, I've been mainly doing parts contracts right, right now, just trying to uh, restructure and hope that I don't find another stumbling block. Right. Um. 
and slowly amassing money. And mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of my progress right now. Yeah. It was just kind of restructuring that. Well, it's you talk about stumbling blocks. I cannot believe this happened to me. Yeah, I saw the title of this ep- episode. Yeah. So. One of the things... Oh, yeah. I mean, seriously. I, I mean, <laughs> Eve has... This has become an abusive relationship. Yeah. And honestly, and I'm sad to say this, but I think I'm going to have to break up with Eve. <laughs> I mean, I think it has really gotten to that point. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the abusiveness, you know, it's like I have my, you know, I have my safe word and yeah. I, and she doesn't listen anymore. You know, you know, whenever it comes to relationships, yeah. you can, you can't change them. You can change the relationship or you can change yourself. Yeah. So you got to change your relationship with Eve. Or you can find yourself stranded. Yeah. Which is you, what I've been finding yeah. a lot of. <laughs> Part of what I love about Kerbal is I love designing and building new ships because, you know, you don't just build a ship. When you design a new ship, when you say, okay, I need a ship that's going to allow me to do whatever. In this case, it's, okay, I need a ship that that will handle Eve. Um, You design and build a ship, but that's not the end of the story. What you do is you design and build it, and then you launch it. And as you're launching, that's generally when you go, oops, I didn't strut something down, and I've got a wobble in there, so I need to go back and fix that. And, you know, oops, this doesn't separate the way I want it to, or oops, you know, there's there's not enough fuel to do what I want here, or there's too much fuel or whatever, you know, you go through this, you build and test brand new ships Mm -hmm. and you can spend, you can spend literally hours doing nothing but refining the design of one ship. And I kept working on this one ship and I finally came up with, I mean, this thing was a, a work of art, a thing of beauty. Okay. And I've got one word to describe it. You ready? Train. 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 One of the things that I have wrestled with Uh is obviously you've got to have enough fuel to get where you're going. We're talking like locomotive train, right? Locomotive train. Okay. Okay. Um, Trying to get X amount of fuel off the ground is a weight equation because X amount of fuel weighs quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. So... Ideally, what, what you end up doing a lot of times is is you put a ship in orbit and then you refuel it before you use it, okay? Well, you run into a problem sometimes where even if you plan on refueling something in orbit, it's still so big when you're trying to get it off the ground that you really are wrestling with that with weight, just trying to get it up there in orbit so that you can refuel it. Mm-hmm. Well, what I discovered was I created a ship... Try and imagine it like this, okay? It's a center fuel tank, okay? And I wrote this down because I wanted to, I, I wanted to get my, my, make sure my terminology was correct. The center fuel tank is, it's a KW rocketry. It's an SB4 LFT tank, okay? The tank has on both ends, uh, both ends of it, it has a senior docking port, okay? One facing forward and one facing back. Okay, and then around uh, arranged symmetrically around that uh, in four symmetry is four more of those tanks. And on the end of those tanks, instead of docking ports, uh, I have the Rocco Max mainsail liquid engine. That's the one with the fifteen hundred thrust. Okay. Mm-hmm. now the land air, the lander part of it sits on the senior docking port at the front of it. Okay, so what you've got basically is you've got a center tank four engines around it, and a lander on the front of it. Now, the train part comes in where I discovered that if I send up fuel tanks, the same type of fuel tank, and they both have senior docking ports front and back, I can create like a train. Mm -hmm. I can have a series of fuel tanks stretching out behind it. So you've got your engine up front, and then you've got a series of fuel tanks. And the fuel tanks themselves have the little bitty atomic rocket motors on them mm-hmm. because they don't, they have just enough thrust, but they don't eat up a lot of fuel, right? Yeah. So I have the maneuverability with the tanks that allow me to rendezvous and dock. The most I've done so far and still had it be stable, and I haven't tried to do more than three, mm-hmm. but when I left for Eve, what I had was I had the main engine and then I had three fuel tanks behind it. And I had, um, and I had it set to where every fuel tank except for the very last one on the very end was shut off. Yeah. So I set up my interplanetary transfer. I burned my engines. And as I was going, as the last fuel tank started to run out, I turned on the one that was in front of it. 
And when the last one ran out, I would just decouple it and let it go. There was no, uh, it, it didn't jerk me around. It didn't, it didn't knock me off my, um, you know, off my trajectory at all. It was a very smooth, I mean, I just let it go and it just smoothly dropped away. Mm -hmm. The little rocket motors are just powerful enough to keep them to where the tanks aren't a major drag on the engine. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're pushing forward just enough to where the little docking ports aren't straining to hold on. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, by the time I actually had established my transfer from Kerbin to Eve, uh, I had dropped two tanks behind me. And so when I got to Eve, I still had essentially two fuel, full fuel tanks. But the train design works very well, surprisingly. Yeah. Here's the problem. This is where I got it because I had been testing this thing and I thought I had wrung out every bug. I thought I had, you know, I thought this was it. This was the perfect thing. When I get to Eve and I'm ready to decouple my lander, that's when I discovered that the four tanks with the engines on them were connected to the lander, not to the center tank. Oh. I didn't, they weren't connected to the center tank by decouplers. So when I, when I detached the lander to go to the surface, my whole return ship just floated away into five separate pieces. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, and they were all full tanks, too. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the tanks that had the engines on the end of them didn't have uh, a docking ports on them. Mm-hmm. So once they detached and floated away, that was it. They were gone. Oh, man. And I was just going, no. I, after all the hours I spent building this thing and testing this thing and putting it together in orbit and all of this, at no point did it occur to me, hey, those four tanks around the center fuel tank aren't actually connected to the center fuel tank. That's the, de- you know how you build things top down? Yeah. That's where you run into, that's where you can miss little things like that. Because when you're building from the top down, you know, those four engines are nice and secure, but you don't realize they're nice and secure at the top and the bottom. They are not connected in any way to the center tank other than the lander itself. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just, (laughs) let's just say I had some interesting, uh, I had some interesting words. Yeah. But here's where my pending breakup with Eve comes. Okay, I had built this. I went online. You know how we were talking about you can go and get all kinds of information. Yes, I alt-tabbed, and I went online, and I I did all this research, how much Delta V I need to get off of Eve. And so I did all this calculation, and I made all these estimates. And, of course, you know, me, I very badly did all those estimates, apparently. The lander that I brought down had a whole bunch of parachutes, and I was able to land with almost no fuel expended at all. Mm Mm-hmm. And I had, the lander had boosters on it. Uh, and the idea was I would use the parachutes to set me down. Uh, so I would end up on the surface of Eve with pretty much all of my fuel and boosters. And boosters, for the weight, they really do pack a lot of punch. Yeah. They are. They're fairly lightweight. They, and, and, you know, they burn fairly heavy. And then you can jettison them. So I thought, okay, this is perfect. I'm, you know, I've, I've made the perfect lander. Here I am sitting on Eve. You know, the, the bottom didn't tear off because I didn't have the, the leg. You know, I didn't have the landing struts, you know, too high up or too low down or whatever. I mean, everything I set down perfectly. Mm-hmm. When I went to launch to get back up, even with the engines at full throttle, even with the boosters going full blast, I think I got maybe 1,000 kilometers up. Yeah. Because Eve's atmosphere ends at about 90,000 kilometers. And about the highest I could get was 1,000. So that was tough. Wah, wah. Wah, wah, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I, I said this last time. The, um, the difficulty with Eve is not landing. It's getting back up. That same lander, which I tested on Kerbin, gets me all the way back up into orbit, and it allows me to create an orbit. But on Eve, it only gets me about a thousand kilometers off the ground and then shuts down. Yeah. And then I get to watch as the, you know, inviting shores of Eve come back up in a hurry. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Man. Yeah. Well, somebody, um, um, I think it was Mittenpoe, I'm not positive, but somebody said that, that their solution to the problem 
was they're not bothering to get back up. They're just landing and creating colonies and, and you know, they're using the cathane mod. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, their, their yeah. solution is, you know, move in the heck with the return trip. Yeah. You know, it's so nice here. We don't yeah. want to go back, but I wanted to, there was a question I wanted to toss out to the listenership. Um, is there anybody out there that routinely goes to even back? Is it, is there anybody out there that's figured out a way to get down and get back up like yeah. routinely? <laughs> because even to this day, and uh, by the way, I have a new hour total for you, 1104 hours in game. Oh, oh. Yay. Um, even at 1104 hours, every time I get, we got more dogs barking. Every time I get down to Eve and try and come back, it, it just rarely happens. Man. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, I, I want advice on Eve. Um, for now, I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to set Eve to the side. You know, uh, you know, I told her, I think I want to see other planets, you know, um, I actually, I'm working on a challenge. Amy gave me a challenge last week. She plays the game using the deadly reentry and the far mods. Okay. To make it more difficult. And she challenged me. She said, I want you to install those mods and I want you to try and, you know, like go to the mine and go to planets and things. So that's, that's where I am now. I'm going to give the, uh, the new mods a try. I've installed them, but I haven't really played with them very much. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's my progress. <laughs> And a depressing progress report it was. Aw. 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 Well, do you want to move on? Yeah, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, well, let's get to our next segment. And now your letters and the latest news in the Mission Briefing. Okay, uh, as Mission Briefing, obviously, we do have uh, some posts uh, about the pending update. And understand... um, by the time this podcast comes out, the update may be released. Yeah, because Tuesdays are usually it's when we release. It's also when yeah. things come out. So right. we've recorded before then. So, so, hey, maybe you're seeing the thing we're talking about. Maybe so we're anyway. wrong. Maybe we're right. Well, since we're welcoming NOS back to the podcast, I please go first. Okay, this comes from the January... Uh, on January 20th, 2015, the dev notes said Harvester reports that he is working on the aerodynamics overhaul, specifically finishing up the new lift model for the lifting and control surfaces and adding a new user interface overlay to help visualize the airworthiness of a space plane during the design and construction phase. Quote, I was also revised the fuel flow logic for air breathing engines to support things like wet wings and such in the future. Turbine engines now drain resources evenly from all tanks in a stage. The stage grouping allows setting up drop tanks and such. This should help with maintaining uh, help with maintaining a balanced craft as fuel is drained out and reduce the need to use fuel lines excessively. Harvester also says there was a feature called Time Warp 2 that he left out of earlier updates but now has uh, nearly completed. That I, from what the way he describes it, it sounds like it's Kerbal Alarm Clock. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you can set it to where. Because how many times do you over warp? Oh, constantly. I that, mean, that's, that's like most of my early progress reports. Like, yeah, and then I accidentally uh, went yeah, past that. Yeah, and then I was the five days past my transfer yeah. window. So, um, quote again. Basically, it lets you select a point ahead of you in your trajectory and have the game auto warp up to that point as fast as is reasonable given the time gap. This feature was delayed because of time and needed to work out how to deal with the warp limits near planetary surfaces to stop warping just before any maneuvers you may have set, and also because they wanted to add a time warp limit when approaching a sphere of influence transition. The auto warp system will respect those limits and step up warp again as soon as conditions allow. Well, that was um, that was the post that he made on January the 20th, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. A couple of days later, he updated the update. Uh, and so we'll pick up with that. This is Harvester. Quote, Kerbal Space Program is about to reach a state in which every single one of the original goals for the game has been reached, and we can say that our original design document has been fulfilled. Because of this, the next update will be our 1.0 release. I'm assuming they're calling it 1.0, considering yeah. they called the last one 0.90. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming 1.0. Um, and with it, we will be leaving early access. This is a landmark moment for us at Squad, as over as after over four years of de- development, we feel that KSP is finally ready to be viewed by all as a complete game. However, this is not the end by any means. And according to Harvester's post, update 1.0 will include 
a new drag model that will take into account things such as part occlusion, facing, and eliminating calculation based on part mass. That's something we talked about as far back as the very first episode of the of the podcast. Do you remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah. When, when we said that when you add aerodynamics, it's it it counts as drag. Mm-hmm. So anyway, wow. Uh, a new lift system uh, corrects the lift so that it is now a function of the square of velocity, not linear, allowing for far more effective and accurate wings. And as mentioned before, a new user interface that shows you the stability of your ships as you build them. And a new engineering's re- engineer's report that warns you of crucial and generally frustrating issues in your design, such as a lack of fuel tanks, engines, or landing gear. I'm assuming it'll also point out things like um, parachutes? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? You may want those. Uh, as mentioned before, the Time Warp 2 feature allows you to choose a point along your orbit, and the game will take you there as fast as physically possible. Also new in Update 1.0. This sounds like cathane to me. Deep space and planetary refueling that will allow you to collect matter from asteroids and other bodies to process into things like fuel and oxidizer. Game over. This is from the dev notes. Quote, be careless with your funds and reputation and you might promptly find yourself no longer having a job at the space center. You can get fired now. Yay. KSP can now fire you. I... I play video games to escape these things. I, I mean, I really do. <laughs> it's the pink slip mod. Uh, let's see. Also in update 1.0, new landing gear, new larger wings, new contracts, new sounds, and new kerbals. New kerbals. For the first time ever, female kerbals oh. will be joining the team at KSC. Yeah, gerbils. Yeah. Or kerbalettes. Kerbalettes. Or gerbils. Ker- kerbets. Ker- kerbets. Mrs. Ker- Miss Kerbals. Let's just keep going. Okay, yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, because yeah, we're probably going to hang ourselves. Yeah. But anyway, that is the um, that's the update on the update. Uh, again, by the time you hear this, this may be out for all we know. Yeah, and that'd be awesome. But anyway, uh, this is this is what we're anticipating. Yeah, so enjoy that potential so. future people. <laughs> A message to the future. Yeah. All right, what's our next letter? This one comes from. Misha, hey guys, now that I've put a few more hours into the latest version, I've got a few more impressions. Basically, given I'm a somewhat experienced player, the updated game is proving to be a nice challenge. Money is fairly tight at first, but once you get the satellite and visual survey contracts, it's possible to keep a positive cash cash flow. And while I was never extravagant in my rocket designs, I'm becoming even more frugal now, with a definite eye to recovering as much as possible. Also, the visual survey contracts have finally forced me into building and flying some planes due to their very lucrative nature. This I have found to be a bit of a challenge, especially before unlocking landing gear, but using girders as takeoff skids and parachutes for landing works mostly. <laughs> Still, my basic Kerbal Experimental Plane uh, Mark I can reach altitudes of 24 kilometers. However, while I'm nicely progressing in the career mode, I do find the game significantly more limiting than before. Previously, I would start launching satellite stations or running other missions, not because of contracts, but because I wanted to. Now I find I don't really have enough spare money, quite apart from needing to upgrade various buildings, to run these vanity projects. Following the career mode contracts presumably means more money won't be an issue with a low failure rate, but doesn't leave much for those extra activities. I guess that mimics more closely the realities of running a space center. Back to my initial point of being somewhat experienced player, I think the game will have need a lot more balancing before it will be approachable to a new player. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Like I was just saying, and that's and I think isn't that what they're indicating? Yeah, new players will use up lots more funds due to trial and error, and given the scarcity of funds early in the game, will likely find themselves caught short. Mm-hmm. As regards to part testing contracts, fully agree with you guys. They should be sensible. No testing of boosters while splash down, and the rewards should be staggered. Achieve some of the test parameters, get some of the rewards. Fulfill them all, get the full reward. Mostly I just ignore parts testing now unless I see one which pays out nicely, as well as being achievable as part of another mission. Having fine print integrated means there's plenty of other mission styles around. For the building upgrades, a lot of your listeners seem to be upgrading the VAB and launchpad early on. I cannot fathom why people need gargantuan rockets just to reach orbit. So far everything I launch fits within the tier 1 limits, which even includes sending simple satellites to the MUN. My initial aim was to get the maneuver nodes back, hence tracking station emission control. After that, astronaut complexes for EVAs and getting more science. Moar science. By the way, did you know that rescuing curls can add to your roster to 
where it goes above the astronaut complex limits. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't either. So while you can't hire more, you can rescue them to get more victim uh, crew. <laughs> so wait a minute. So are there just like random Kerbals floating around the planet that you can go pick up? Yeah, yeah, just drifters. You get drifter Kerbals like okay. from out of town. Okay, here's here's Scraggly Mr. Beards here's Mr. Dangerous. Nitpicky chiming in. How did they get there? <laughs> well, there's a reason you just got hired to an established space program. Uh, oh, yeah. okay. So this is like the, yeah, it's like uh, hey, uh, we yeah. we need to solve an HR issue. We need to go pick that right, guy up. Right. Also, hey, you know what? That would explain why there's no buildings on the planet other than the space center. Yeah, because the previous space program destroyed it all. Yeah, and you know they uh, they get hired because they have tenure. Yeah. So those yeah. based on that theory, those poor guys have been up there a long time, a really long time. Yeah. Also, not buying an upgrade until you have enough money to keep going. One of your listeners said to have at least double the proposed upgrade. Goes all the way back to Elite on the C64. Never buy a ship upgrade if it will leave you with less cash than to buy a hold full of computers. KSP 0.90, the penny-pinching edition, Misha. Um, the next letter I'm going to read you, um, because last week uh, Amy Kay was uh, was able to fill in, it was literally at the last second. Yeah, and she did awesome. Yes, by the she way. did I, awesome. I didn't say it Absolutely. enough. She, you, guys, you guys did awesome. It was really cool. There was, um, as we mentioned before, okay. there was a six-hour. Okay, I lied. What? I lied. What did you lie about? It was actually, okay, we fooled everyone, and we can just be honest now. That was my... I'd been practicing for a while. That, oh, that was my was Amy K impression. Yay! Yeah, very good. Yeah. very good. I I actually you know flew all the way out to uh, to England. You are and a dressed, man and dressed of, up. You are a man of many talents. <laughs> there was a six hour time difference between us. Oh, uh, it, took, it was. Oh, you did, so you like ask her a question and six hours later she yeah responds. really yeah no not time delay time difference. <laughs> That would, yo, oh boy. You're doing it through the mail? How are yeah. you guys doing this? That would have been a fun podcast. Yeah. It would have, you know, it would have been our first 24 hour podcast. Yeah. Hey, what do you think of Kerbal? What? Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, when we started recording, uh, it was, uh, if I remember right, it was 6 p.m. my time. It was midnight her time. Oh, trooper. Yeah. Uh, so, and when we got done, it was about 2 a.m. for her. Um, not wanting to throw her in the deep end, especially with no warning at all, I selected just a handful of letters. Yeah. Uh, and so we missed a lot of letters in the last podcast. So some of these are actually two weeks old, and this is one of them. Mm-hmm. And I even referenced this letter because I, I remembered what was in it, but yeah, I couldn't remember where it, it came so you from. Didn't read it in that episode. Yeah, yeah. So this was a letter that was originally meant for last week's podcast. It's two weeks old, but uh, it's from Andrew M. And it says, hi, Biff and Noss. I started again with the release of beta than ever, and have found it slow going to start with. I have thought about restarting and giving myself more funds, but I enjoy the sense of achievement when I get enough funds to upgrade my space center. I have used the admin building to convert 30% of my reputation gains into science, and another 60% goes to cash. Haven't gotten used to the dirt, uh, haven't, have... I'm mangling this person. <laughs> have gotten used to the dirt track runway, but I land next to it rather than on it as it is smoother. Although the groundskeeper runs out and yells, my grass! Yeah. My gra- What'd you do to my grass? That is the ridiculous part, though. It's like everybody's like, oh, yeah, just, you know, yeah, slowly, land on the grass. Slowly drive off of the runway and go on the smooth ground next right, to it. I was right. Like, Why did you build a bumpy runway? Kerbal needs a groundskeeper, Willie. Yeah. Get off me, grass. <laughs> that was a bad crown sp- Okay, I'm not I'm not good at impersonating. Okay. I agree that the parts testing should be more tutorial like. This would help new players as well as give them more relevance. It could be that they already are and I'm doing everything wrong. Uh no, I don't think that's correct. My million this is what I referred to in the previous episode. My million pound idea would be an app that allows me to design rockets and planes while I'm away from the computer and then send the templates to my account. Homer to your mobile, Andrew M. What's next? This one comes from Ben from Brisbane. Our hey, I hope that uh that code's working out for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He was yeah. one of our winners, the uh, custom control pad. Yeah, I, I hope it I hope it helped. Hey, Biffinos, Redditor uh, slash you slash Scott Kerman has been creating some quick KSP guides, each about a dozen slides long. I'm not sure if you've seen them or not, but they're worth a mention since they have both great tips and new players 
and are a handy reference for those of us who occasionally forget the important stuff. This is a list of guides he's working on as he commented on his first intermediate plane guide post. Basic orbital maneuvers, getting to orbit, uh, intermedial intermediate orbital trans maneuvers, <laughs> maneuver lunar travel. Oh, thank God I'm not the only one. Yeah. Advanced orbital maneuvers, interplanetary travel, basic rocket design, intermediate rocket design, advanced rocket design, basic space plane design, immediate plane design, advanced plane design, and I don't think they have a central home yet. And that was Ben from Brisbane. Okay. Um, we got another letter. Uh, this came in from Rough Draft. And he says, hello, Biff and Nos. I've been listening to your podcast for about a month now, the same amount of time that I've been playing Kerbal. When I found your podcast, I listened to every episode in about two days. Oh, wow. I'm not kidding. I'm a welder. What is, that? is that feasible? Well, yeah, if you drink a lot of Red Bull and don't get any sleep. Oh, okay. I'm a welder, and I work outdoors, so I listen to your podcast through my entire work day. I've been really meaning to write in for a while, but I keep forgetting. So forgive me for bringing up some old topics. Well, it's been a crazy two days, man. Yeah, there you go. Get some sleep. I was going to do an audio letter, but I really didn't trust myself not to ramble on for 20 minutes. Yeah, because, you know, Biff never does that. (laughs) See, that's that's why you make a podcast. So you can just do as much as you want. And then edit as you go. Uh, He Ah. says, from listening to your podcasts, I was able to rendezvous on my second try. Oh, Good oh, job. Hey, great wow. job. I've gotten quite good at it. I've never docked yet, though, as every time I get to having docking ports, I end up restarting my game. So far, I've only been able to land on the MUN, but this weekend I'm going to try to travel outside the Kerbin system. Wish me luck. We wish you luck. Yeah. You guys asked in a previous episode not long ago about people using alternative controllers. I personally have used Sidewinder Flight Stick, and it is, but it is starting to die So it sometimes causes more problems than it's worth. Overall, it's an okay experience, and when I get a new flight stick, it will probably be more worthwhile. Also, I remember Biff in an episode talking about flying in cockpit view. You said that the problem was that you couldn't look around out the windows like IRL, so it made things much harder. I have a solution for you. It's called Track IR. Track IR is a head tracking controller that tracks your head in six degrees of freedom. This, in short, will allow you to look around your cockpit, even leaning to look out windows. KSP doesn't natively support Track IR, but there is a mod called Curb Track that adds support for it. Hmm. I haven't personally tried it out in KSP, even though I own a Track IR, but it looks, you know, I'm saying Track IR, it may be Track Er. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like whenever I had AV8R, and yeah. I never want, and like until the end, I was like, oh, yeah, Aviator. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Like, it's like reading a license plate. Yeah. Uh, I am very slowly catching on that that may be pronounced Track- Tracker. Tracker. So, anyway, if uh, if it is, in fact, pronounced Tracker, just kind of mentally go back and, and think that I said yeah. it every time. Trackier. Yeah, Trackier. Trackier. Uh, he says, I own a Trackier, uh, and he hasn't personally tried it out in KSP, but it looks pretty cool. If you're not up for a $200 investment, it also supports some Who other. Isn't? Yeah, really. It also supports some other head tracking technologies that use webcams. From the icy Canadian prairies, rough draft, Homer to your mobile. Are you ready for the PS? Because you remember, where did he say he's from the icy Canadian prairies? Yeah. PS. I downloaded episode six like 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> You, you do your country proud. Yes, you do. Yeah. Yes, you do. You do your country proud, Rough Draft. That is yes. th- that is one of our oldest running jokes, yeah, that I is That is going to be uh, Canada's like national podcast. Yeah. It's just episode six, not the Kerbal Cast. Just episode six. I, I, I can't... I'm, I'm trying to remember which goes back further, Diary of Planet or episode six. Ooh, I think Diary of Planet was episode three. Okay. I, th- I think wow. it was. Wow, okay. Yeah, because that's when we were talking music. Okay. Yeah. So, so Diary is technically the older, longer running joke, but still... It's yeah. one of it's one of our older. I think the jokes. oldest joke we have is episode one. Yeah, the whole thing's. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, so uh, we have a thank you. We would like to thank the Space Sim website hobbyspace.com for featuring Kerbalcast in an article on their front page. Yes. Yeah, we've made it, baby. Yeah, Hobby baby. Space has been around for years and is a fun website for all the Ker- for the Kerbaler and all of us. 
They feature articles on space news, space games like Kerbal Space Program, and even links to space sim software. Mm -hmm. And you can find them, of course, at www.hobbyspace.com. I'm I'm not kidding. I I remember being on hobbyspace.com as far back as as like 2001. Yeah. Because they had um they had um a link to an Apollo style lander that you oh. they have links to all kinds of space sim games and they had a link to one and it was a fully graphically I mean it looked real and it was, you know, everything worked like it was supposed to and that was kind of my first taste of actually trying to land an, a mooner a uh, mooner Moon. Listen to me, Moon. lunar, yeah, a lunar lander, yeah, and uh, and it was it was it was my er, it was an early Kerbal for me because you know I struggled and struggled and struggled to get that thing down, and then the first time I did, it was like yes for the win. <laughs> so anyway, uh, is it me or is it you? It is you. It's me. Okay, we had a question come up uh, in the previous couple episodes, and it is, what do you call a bunch of Kerbals? And you remember we've had, you know, like a degree, a debris, debris of Kerbals yeah, and things like a, that. Yeah, a crash of Kerbals. Well, John M. writes in to say, a crash of Kerbals, of course. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, not to not to idea, but David in California says there's only one proper name for a group of Kerbals, a squad. A squad of a squad. Kerbals! That's perfect, because I had said that I thought what would be perfect would be a homer of Kerbals. Oh, yeah. A squad of Kerbals there is you, so much better. There you go. For the win! <laughs> again! Okay, it's me again? Yeah, right back at you. Okay, uh, from Crater. Uh, hi, Biff. Uh, Nos in absentia, although you're not. Not not this time. I'm here for you. I'm yeah, here, you're here, I'm for, here you, for, you, for you, baby. And not Nos, a.k.a. Amy K. Please, please, please never, ever play clips like the one from QVC again. I sat at my desk <laughs> crying, <laughs> laughing, particularly at the thought of someone standing up at the AIA, good Lord, IAU, which is International Astronomical Union yeah. Conference, to say, but of course Pluto is a planet. People live on it. <laughs> I only hope that nobody out there was listening while driving. Yeah. I'm not sure that there is a collective noun for Kerbals, since I'm beginning to suspect that they don't, or at least shouldn't, congregate. I have a theory that there is actually a critical mass of Kerbals. I mean, think about it. If you put one Kerbal into orbit, you can build a ship without too much difficulty that does the job. If you try to put three Kerbals at once into orbit, there's definitely a bigger chance that your ship will blow up. Trying to put 10 up at once has an even bigger chance of explosion. Trying for 20 or 30, and you'll see lots of bangs. I think that it's the Kerbals. They're unstable, and when too many of them get together, they go critical and cause things to explode. So, we shouldn't have a collective noun for them. We should be trying to keep them apart. Homer to your mobile. You know, he's, he's right. The more of them you put in something, like when I made that mega roll, it had 13 yeah. Kerbals in it, and it blew up a lot. I don't, th on a, I don't think I've ever done maybe more than five at once on yeah. a launch. You know, I'll have like a, I'll have a capsule with three seats and then I'll have like a hitchhiker's container or something. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done more than five, hmm. maybe six at the outside. So I can't fathom the idea of putting thir 30 in orbit at once. <laughs> Can no, you you're not going to make a that? colony ship? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, that or like a really unruly school bus. Yeah. They're like, Hey, you kids, shut up. <laughs> so, um, let's see. I have the last letter. So you're next. Yep. This okay. is uh neuronic 17. I forgot to send this in last week, and I'm sure someone would have said it already, but you mentioned Minecraft having no way of ditching the monsters that you can just chill and mine resources to build without being disturbed. There's a not very new option in the settings for difficulty called Peaceful that removes them leaving the sandbox mode you wanted. Funny enough, it's the mode I play on it the most, and I like to chill out without creepers preparing to assault my carefully crafted castle. Much the same way I like it when the Kraken doesn't interfere with my EVE missions, which brings me to my Kerbal-related notes. I've never actually planned to return from the surface of EVE. With the likes of the Kessane mod, I've mapped the planet and carefully chosen a location to build a Kerbal colony instead of making a permanent outpost from where I can explore using rovers and drones, using the inflatable balloons from Hooligan Labs. This leaves me with supply runs to make for things that Kessane can't be converted into, so I always have something to do. And maybe someday I'll drop down the sections of a ship to bring the stupid, I mean brave Kerbals home. <laughs> On another note, there was a nice change having a female voice on the show. Bringing Amy on again in the future would be a nice way to mix things up. 
May the Kraken be ever in your favor, Neuronic 17. I don't think Amy wants to be back on the show. I think after, <laughs> I think after, I think it was such a traumatic experience. I don't know. It may her. kick you off for an episode and have two of us do it. Now that's then, true. Then again, that's true. This is in your house with your recording equipment, but you know. You know what though? If it, if after if, they dig you out of the freezer, you know, if whatever. we ever did a curveball, if we ever did an episode where I sat out, you guys would never let me back. <laughs> You'd go, you know, that went so much easier. I'm going to take my toys and I'm going home. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm going home. I'm not going to do the rest of Cartman yeah. on that one. But yeah, um, there was, um, um, I got off on some tangents last week and I did some editing. They're yeah. not there anymore. But uh, it w- was it the Cheez Its rant again? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You know, because them Cheez Its, they get me going. Now, poor Amy. I mean, it was like, you know, 1 a.m., 1.30, 2 a.m. on her end. And I'm going off on these, you know, Firefly and Star Trek and... And, you know, and she's just sitting there, you know, like, with her eyes half open going, will you please shut up? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I don't think Amy wants to come back. I don't know. Uh, And with my history with women, that would not be a surprise. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, one evening with me and never want to come back. Uh, I have two letters from North Star, and this is, again, because we skipped some letters. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, uh, have so to, you have to condense. What I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly summarize uh, the older letter, and then we have a letter, an audio letter from Thomas Eccles. I'm going to play that, and then I'm going to go to uh, North Star's most recent letter, because this is a conversation that we're going to need to have. Okay. Um, North Star, this is the first one, and this is the older letter. Uh, in his last letter to us, Northstar mentioned he was working on the old Strafford Taurus mod, and he needs your help. But it turns out that's not all he's working on. Quote, Greetings, fellow Kerbonauts. I hope your rockets are flying straight and your space planes are gliding smoothly today. I come to you all with a very important announcement. I'm sure some of you have heard of the KSP Community CubeSat project. If not, I have kindly provided Biff and Noss with a link to the project thread on the KSP website, and the separate forum they recently established for the project. And I will have a link to that on our show page. Mm -hmm. As I'm sure you already know, the KSP Community CubeSat project aims to place a small CubeSat, a type of cheap satellite usually launched as a secondary tertiary payload on a larger rocket, for those of you unfamiliar, in low Earth orbit on behalf of the KSP community. You're all free and welcome to join in on the effort I am doing, by the way. Uh, Again, we will post a link to that. Uh, Northstar has got his hands full. Uh, He's working on the CubeSat, and he's also working on the older mod. Uh, Let's move on. We do have an audio letter uh, from Thomas Eccles. Hello, Biff and Noss. As you know, my name is Thomas Eccles, a.k.a. Mr. Monkey Worsley, a.k.a. Seconded Tommy Freckle. <laughs> I'm gonna look at AKAs now. Anyway, but guys, this is an almost an outbreak. On the 27th of January, it will be the first anniversary of me getting the game. So yeah, whoop whoop to that. I have probably covered about oh probably about 500 hours on it. Um, probably the same amount as when Biff just started up. I've had an amazing year with Kerbal Space Program, and to see the progression of the game. And I have to say, there are a couple of things I'd love to change with it. And the first one is, I can't get Noss's idea out of my head of a scrollable contract thing. <laughs> anyway, guys, but I do have a challenge for Biff and Noss, and of course the listeners if they do want to. I challenge you to... Pause for dramatic effect. I challenge you to visit every single biome in... Biff, you're gonna hate me. Science mode. I mean, I could have gone career mode, and Biff really would have killed me. Um, but apart from that, I think um, it would give Noss a nice change from career mode. And Amy K, you're also getting challenged. I hope to hear about that next week, guys, and I'll speak to you all later. Hope you have a star to steer by. Now I gotta go steer by mine. Goodbye. And goodbye. And I want to say. Happy, Happy birth. birthday. Yeah. Uh, his birthday is January the 29th. He will be 13 years old. Oh, awesome. Are you ready for this? I mean, this this will warm your heart. Mm-hmm. Do you know how come I know this? His grandmother emailed me. Oh, grandma. Yeah she, grand- yeah, she emailed me and she said, is there any way that you could wish him a happy birthday? Yeah. 
Uh, it's his 13th birthday. And we said no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but then our hearts grew three yeah. sizes too small. <laughs> too small or too big? No, it grew three sizes that day. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It grew. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you you know, need to get your Grinch references down. You, you know what? To, that would to study up. I, I, that would have been a completely different episode of The Grinch if his heart actually shrank even more. Yeah, he just became more evil, sort of like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> going you know, to, like going a Christmas, to the bathroom in the Christmas Like a gifts. Christmas carol, you know, it's like he goes over to the Cratchit's house and he goes, where's Tiny Tim? And then he kicks his crutch out. <laughs> you know, it's like, this isn't the heart, heartwarming Christmas tale I remember. But anyway, uh, happy birthday. Uh, he has uh, submitted stuff to us yeah. in the past, uh, and he's done some audio and some video stuff. Very talented uh, and, and very bright. Yeah, and, uh, and yeah, we... We wish you the best birthday uh, that you can possibly have. Yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday. And thanks, Grandma. Thanks for letting me know. That was very sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I woke, honestly, seriously, I woke up this morning, and there was like, I got an email from Thomas Eccles' grandmother. Which, it reminds us, anytime we say anything, we're like, oh, you know, we have have a very nice grandmother listening. Yeah. And we also have, you know, he's in his teens now, so he's he's crazy and rebellious. That's true. That's true. you, You know. Young people, so Uh-oh. like half the things we've said, we probably need to, you know, Uh-oh. wash our mouths out. So, do you know but, what that means? What? Do you know what that means? Starting Thursday, he's gonna be wearing like a leather jacket. Oh yeah, and riding a motorcycle. Uh huh. You know, and he'll be like surly. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's that's how it happens here. Yeah. You know, it just goes nuts. It, it could happen. You know, like I, I'm uh, over twice that age. Yeah. And I have like twenty leather jackets on right now. I'm sweating. Yeah. It's just real gross. And and, le- and let me tell you, you can't take them off. Yeah, and let me tell you, it smells good too. Oh yeah, ah. that's how it's like. That's how what it's like here in America. Yeah, just, just so you guys it's just, know, we're, we're we're overweight and yeah. we sweat a lot <laughs> and smell bad. A lot of leather jackets. Were really um, cool. I said that we were going to go from the audio letter into the second North Star letter. It turns out I forgot we have another letter. Yeah, I got and like, I don't want to skip I it. I got over. like two more. You have two more. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, blow through them, so man. Eat it. First one's from Armin. Being a novice to KSP, I don't have any strong opinion regarding 0.90. I've only been playing KSP since last fall, so I didn't get too used to, you know, .25 anyway. I found out that career mode is not my kind of game, so I play it in the Biffian way rather than the Nossian. I finally settled down in science mode because I like the continuous need to explore and get science. I, who knew that you and I are, we, I mean, we are founders in a school of philosophy, yeah. apparently. <laughs> the Biffian. I crash, therefore I am. Yeah, that's right. But administrating money definitely takes away the fun for me. I wish I had the character development in science mode, though. I successfully run an Apollo 8-style mission with multiple moon orbits. The funny thing about the mission was that I didn't expect any new rocket to work, so I didn't even save it. However, it worked so nicely on my first launch that, in fact, I decided to run the mission right away. Now my most famous rocket is called Untitled Spacecraft. (laughs) Looking forward to the next episode, Armin. You can, hey, you can, uh, so this is like one of the few things I know about this game. What? You can, uh, you can rename the vessel after you've launched it. So. Yeah, I've discovered yeah. that. Yeah. And you can also change, uh, what it is, like ship or debris or lander yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So usually I'll rename it to, hey, this one yeah. worked. Yeah. Like, I, I won't name them until they make it. What I do, because I have accidentally deleted stuff that I didn't mean to. What I do a lot of times is if there's something that I want to get rid of, I will literally rename it delete. Oh, yeah. I'll change the name of it to delete, and that way I know for sure when I go back to the space center, to the tracking station, mm-hmm. I'm deleting the correct thing. Yeah. I can't tell you how many have so. had that. I named the first one, yeah. and there's like five of them with the same name floating around. Have you noticed the number of people that have really latched onto your idea of scalable difficulty? Yeah, and I'm not asking for money for that. I would just yeah. like to see it happen, like because I really think... Um, which which is funny because some people have given variants of that idea. Mine mm-hmm. was when you accept a contract, you choose yeah. how difficult you want it to be. Right. So it'd be like, you know, there'd be a star for each parameter, like mm-hmm. this high, this speed, you know, this, you know, this, uh, you know, like altitude, all these right. different things. Right. Well, somebody else said that you would get a portion of the money for each part mm-hmm. of the contract you completed. Right. And if you didn't complete it, then, you know, you lost whatever money was left. And I think that would be interesting, too, yeah. because, like, let's say you could manage to get the altitude and the test and, you know, being in the right planetary system correct, but you just couldn't get the speed. Well, you, you got three quarters of it, so that would be that would be something. You do realize what's, what this makes them, though, right? What? Adherence to the Gnosian philosophy. Oh, yeah. 
The school of Nas. The school of Nas, <laughs> with 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 one hundred percent less Jack Black. Yeah, and uh, and highly graded on a curve here. Yeah, like we're, exactly. We're just, okay, we'll get to the next letter. Okay, the next one comes from Skyzar. Skyzar, hail Skyzar. Hello, podcasters. Listening to your last podcast and being able to understand half of the conversation for once, I was intrigued by the mention of old <laughs> space games in the Internet Archive. I feel I should bring the attention of your growing army of listeners a couple of games they may have missed. Back in 1993, there was a game called Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space. The game challenges the player to beat the Americans or the Russians you choose to the moon. Didn't Isn't there a revamped version of that now on Steam? I'm not sure. I could have sworn I saw that. I don't know. It's deceptively simple, yet really compelling and addictive. I've been playing it for more than 20 years, and it's been a bit like a proto-KSP. The original game is now abandonware, but that version is buggy, and instead, people should just get the open-source version. Being open source, it will run on all platforms, Linux, OS X, and the other one, and and can be uh, fetched from www.raceintospace.org. Uh, I'm looking on Steam. Uh, on October 31st, 2014, they added Buzz Aldrin's Space Program Manager. Is that the same thing? Uh, it's Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space is the title he gave. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Close. Now, many people of my generation will have invested thousands of happy hours playing Elite, the space trading game originally produced for the BBC Micro and eventually ported to many other 8-bit and 16-bit computers. The 16-bit ports were all pretty bad. The DOS version is now available as abandonware, but it's rubbish also. Instead, (laughs) space cadets should go to um, oolite.org, ulite.org, and get the updated open source version called Ulite. It's been modernized and improved to take advantage of modern PC hardware, but keeps the heart of the original intact. I'd recommend people try some of the visual plugins to improve the look of the game, and I found it a lot easier to play with the joystick. Again, it's open source, so we'll work on all modern platforms. Again, thanks for the great podcast. You know, I want Skyzar to get a job as a reviewer. <laughs> Can you imagine it'd be like it'd be like a new game came out and they go, Skyzar, what do you think? It's rubbish. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, just just lay it down. He, um, did you catch that comment about he understood half of it for once? Yeah. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I was talking to Amy, um, there are some cultural things. There are certain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, certain... uh, he had a, in the PS, he was talking about, um, the use of the word mental, mm-hmm. um, here versus there. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Um, I've heard, uh, if I'm, if, if I remember right, I think, isn't it Ron Weasley and, and Harry Potter that talks about, you know, people being mental? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm familiar with the terminology, but there were a couple of, and I'm not going to say them here because I don't want Thomas Eccles' grandmother to come whoop me or something. Uh-huh. But there were a couple of things that we say here that have a completely different meaning over there and vice versa. Yeah. And, uh, and what I thought was interesting talking with Amy was, you know, sometimes we'd talk about something and I would, and I'd make a comment and she'd go, there's a cultural reference I'm missing. Mm hmm. And I and I would explain it, and she'd go, "Okay, because that 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 has no meaning here." Yeah, yeah. So that was very. It's like you know, we're both speaking mm-hmm. English, but we're not both speaking. You know, it's like there's English and there's American English, or English English and American English. Yeah, like so. I want I want to go on about you know how pizza is a vegetable and that yeah, you know the right. Sasquatch exists, and they're like, I don't know where you where you're talking <sighs> about. Or uh, this is a this is a political callback, but uh, ketchup is a vegetable. Yeah. Okay, let me get to this. Uh, this is the letter uh, that came in from North Star, and this literally came in this morning. Uh, and this is what we're going to have our conversation about. Uh, Dear Kerbalcast team, uh, again, North Star, I write to you guys again with a heavy heart. Squad has decided to announce that the next version of Kerbal Space Program will be 1.0, and with it, KSP will officially move out of beta. I think that this is, and these are all caps, a very, very, very bad idea, to say the least. Kerbal is great, but it is still loaded with bugs. There are confirmed bugs on the official bug tracker about memory leaks, UI glitches, CTDs, and countless other problems. I've experienced many of these bugs countless times myself, although I haven't bothered to try to reproduce them and submit bug reports for them. In my opinion, at the very least, KSP should stay, or I'm sorry, should go through one more bug-focused update that speaks purely to polish the game, uh, that seeks purely to polish the game, and remove as many bugs from it as possible before they move into 1.0 and official release. 
Ideally, they should also wait for Unity 5 multiplayer. Uh, a Unity 5 multiplayer, which is still in development and won't be ready for 1.0 at this rate, and work further on trying to make 64-bit stable before they even think of calling KSP ready for release. Oh, and did I mention KSP could use some simple visual improvements like clouds and some heavy optimization? I don't know what's gotten into Squad. This announcement of the 1.0 release, even more than the decision to move into beta, which I would also argue shouldn't have happened, betas are for bug fixing, and they've still been releasing new features since moving into it, caught me completely by surprise and left me shocked, stunned, and wondering just what Squad was thinking. So, I pose the question, do you, at the Kerbal Podcast, and you, the listeners, if you have time to write in for the next episode, think Kerbal is ready for its 1.0 final release? If so, why or why not? And did I mention, there is a poll on the community forum about whether KSP is ready for release. So far, more than 76% have answered the poll, no. And I called up that forum. I was curious. It says, as of today, uh, what is today anyway? Today's uh, January the 25th. As of today, uh, 538 people have voted. 132 have said, yes, KSP is ready for 1.0. Uh, and um, that amounts to basically 25%. And 406 people, or roughly 76%, have said, no, it's not ready for 1.0. Uh, back to North Star. I also have started a thread on the matter. This one is a suggestion to roll back the decision to move to version 1.0 over to the suggestions and development subforum rather than a poll about whether players think the game is ready. Hopefully a moderator doesn't lock it down before the podcast is released. As always, it would be a pleasure to hear from you guys and girls. Uh, parentheses, I rather enjoyed Amy Kay's participation in the last podcast. And I look forward to hearing what you guys think about the matter rather soon. Now, I wrote him back and I said, okay, other than semantics, what is, I need more information here. What, what's the difference between, you know, a, a quote unquote official release and a beta? Uh -huh. And he wrote back and said, quote, it means that the game is officially out of beta and is considered scope and feature complete. What worries me about this is that it will appear to reviewers and potential players that Squad is signaling the game is finally complete, even if they are in reality still planning a lot more free updates. This will inevitably lead to a very different paradigm in their reviewing the game, and I worry reviewers will not be so forgiving about things like bugs, lack of optimization, and even a simple lack of clouds on Kerbin. It may be a matter of semantics, but it is a very significant matter of sem semantics, one that could potentially make or break Squad and KSP's future. Uh, again, that letter from Northstar, he says, regards. What do you think? Do you have an opinion on this? I think leaving early... Uh, what, it's weird with early access. Yeah. Because if you're in it for too long, people start to get real skeptical. Mm -hmm. But there have been a lot of articles about how Kerbal Space Program has been like a shining you know, example yeah. of early access done right. Right. Because they're constantly updating, they're constantly working toward it. Now, what does it mean to leave early access mm -hmm. and to say that your game is essentially um, released? Right. Well, it means that it is also free to complete scrutiny without the ability to say, hey, we're still working on it. Because mm -hmm. you can continue to work on any game after that. Okay, so let's look at a game that's completely done when it was released. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a lot of different ones you could do. Let's, let's just do, let's do like Half-Life 2. Okay. It was released. It was completed. And it was judged on any scrutiny it had there. Well, everyone was fine with that. Games can, and it may have had bugs here or there, who knows. Let's take a game that was released but was not completed, which is almost everything that uh, Ubisoft and Activision have done on the <laughs> Xbox 360 and yeah. PS3. No kidding. You, whenever you're downloading updates on day one, well, I mean, that got a lot of scrutiny mm -hmm. because it's like you're sending us incomplete games and it's not completely done, so it hits a lot of like you know people judge them harshly. Well, and there's also, there's, uh, and I've seen this specifically with Ubisoft, is they will release incomplete games, the reviews will be terrible, people won't buy them, and then they don't finish them. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and if somebody thinks that I'm just making that up, uh, let, let me toss out one game title for you. Silent Hunter 5. 
to this day is a buggy mess. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, and it's just it's please just left continue, up but but for someone who thinks I, I made that up, do I think Squad's going to do that? No, because I mean this is their big debut game, and they're not like. Wait a minute, do do you think Squad's going to do what? I uh, just let it sit out, sit out the dry. Oh, okay, like they're like, okay, gotcha. we're done. We're gonna do. I think they're going to do that. Absolutely not. Right. I mean, first off, this is like their big game, and if their reputation hangs largely on this, and mm. so far that reputation has been amazing because they've done an amazing job. They right. have. Right. And, you know, despite any, like, any little nitpicks I've had about this update are just little tiny bumps on a very big road. Mm-hmm. And the, they've, you know, we have paid the cost for this really nice runway, so it's no longer <laughs> that dirt track that's not as smooth as the grass next to it. Oh, I love that metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> so, Good tie-in, yeah. man. Good tie-in. So, um, do I think that it is bad for them to say, hey, it is released? Actually, yeah, I agree with Northstar on that. I think I think it wouldn't hurt to say, hey, we're doing to 0.95 mm-hmm. or something, right. and, and we're doing some more fixes. But there are some bugs, and the way that the game runs, a lot of people are going to think that it's an incomplete game where every Steam sale that's happened so far, you would click on it to look at it on that amazing price, yeah, and you would see early access. Whenever I see early access as a consumer, the first thing I tell myself is, well, I can't expect it to run perfectly, but it runs well enough to play. Right. I have a lot of early access games that I've bought, and I'm completely fine with. Whenever they say they're leaving early access, that's whenever I that's whenever I, you know, decide. Well, I'm going to play it, but I'm no longer going to give it the benefit of a doubt on early access because mm-hmm. it's no longer saying, "Hey, be patient with us. We're working on it." It's saying, "Hey, it's done." And I mean, there are always games always have updates, especially PC games, but it's it's opening yourself up to being getting full scrutiny on right. a, something that isn't fully done. I'm it's tough for me to render an opinion on this simply because even with all of its flaws, Kerbal Space Program is hands down my favorite game. Yeah. Um and and I will say of all time. There are other games that I have played that I just absolutely loved, but I've never played a game like I played this game. Mhm. So it's a little difficult for me. Um, I can understand exactly the point, though. Um, there are things about the game, even as much as I love this game, there are things about it that I do have problems with. Yeah. And I can see that somebody who hasn't played this game for over a year, like I have, I can see somebody coming into it with the mindset of, this is a finished game. And the first time they hit a bug, or here's one, the first time they try to load 64-bit and they get that window. Mm-hmm. I mean, re- that window to me is almost like a spoof of what those windows should read like. Yeah. You know, please bear in mind, this is very unstable and this will attack your house cats. And this will, you know, I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, it's like I'm not used to clicking on a link for something and it comes up and it goes, okay, you do realize you're doing this at your yeah. own peril. Yeah, don't get too excited. Yeah. I'm not used to that. I've mm-hmm. never run into that before. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can see somebody brand new who has no history with this game whatsoever coming to it thinking that it is a finished game. Because, really, how do we know that it's a game that's still in progress? Well, because we're active Kerblers. Yeah. Because we read the dev notes. Because we, you know, we follow what's going on with the game. Well, there's a lot of games out there that I don't know squat about. Yeah, like I play them, but I don't. Yeah. I don't know all the details behind like what's the latest thing they're doing. There's um, there's a game on Steam called Goat Simulator. Have you? Have you yeah, okay. yeah, I have it. Well, they they literally. I mean, when they released it, it was basically it was this is a joke. We are releasing this buggy, incomplete game as a joke. It's never going to be updated. We're never going to do anything other than what it is here. Mm-hmm. This is meant to be. You know, this is a. It's 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 like a joke stupid game mm-hmm. like anybody would really want to play goat simulator yeah but i know that story now for some reason if i didn't know that story and i was sitting around going you know if if there was one game i could have it would be that would allow me to play as a goat hey there it is yeah. oh i bet this is a technical marvel yeah and then i'd play it and i'd go this sucks like why would they release something that's not yeah so i i could see i i get his point um, I, you know, the reason that I'm, I'm kind of 
navigating the the middle of this mm-hmm. is because I think my own personal bias is so strong. It's difficult for me to step outside of it. Yeah. But I do think he has a very strong point. And as I said earlier, there have been a lot of articles and stuff on like, you know, um, early access done right mm-hmm. is, is one we had. Another one is like, you know, champions of early access and they're always featured. Well, something that's been followed enough, like people are writing articles about a game that's in development, Mm -hmm. you know, so people are watching it and it's KSP and it has a lot of, you know, people involved with it. A lot of people play it whenever it leaves early access, Mm -hmm. it's going to get like, people are going to notice Yeah, if it is not a beautiful transition into early access, there are going to be a lot of articles about, you know, our shiny example of early access came out and it didn't work out too well. You know, you know or like it still had bugs when it left. What does this mean for early access? You know, you make an, uh, an excellent point, which I hadn't really considered, but you're right. The, the, every article that I've read about squad up to this point that talks about squad uh, squad Kerbal, uh, every, every article that I've read about Kerbal that mentions it being an early access game, inevitably somebody in there will go, this is early access done right. Yeah. Because um, it is. Yeah, and, and, and the the tone of the article is, this is a great game, uh, this is a great company, these guys are doing a great job, uh, it's got its problems, but man, does this game show progress. Yeah. Man, are they doing yeah. it right. Yeah, you're right. I could, I could see a shift in reviewers' tones. Yeah, because it's now saying, they're saying it's done. Yeah. They left early access. Yeah. And, I mean, it's kind of hard for them to leave early access, but still tell everyone, hey, we're not completely done yet. Right. We're just leaving early access. Yeah. And also, I, I will say, I know Squad is going to hate me for saying this, um, but Squad tends to be somewhat secretive. Yeah. You know, um, when you look at their Twitter feed and when you look at their press releases, I mean, they'll tell you what they're working on. But a lot of times there's that kind of, you know, eh, we got something behind the curtain over here. Just you wait. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're not going to tell you. Which can build suspense. But yeah, but it's at, also. At the same time, you know, we kind of want to know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they, they can be very secretive. And, yeah. and I think that, I mean, I think that can work against them. And theoretically, this could work against them. You yeah. know, if, if they are being secretive and then they finally reel it, roll it out and people go, okay, we had our hopes set for not that. Yeah. And if they were to, like, this final update they make as they leave early access, maybe it's going to fix so many things. Everyone's going to be like, oh, okay, well, mm-hmm. you guys had some pretty cool stuff behind that curtain. Yeah. You know, we're totally fine with this. But there were... I mean, I can already tell there will be some gripes, yeah, and they will be bugs, mm-hmm. multiplayer, and uh, just performance, yeah, because of how the game uh, utilizes your computer to make itself run. If I I'm seriously, hands down, if I had one gripe about KSB, uh-huh. because you know, again, I'm a sandbox player. Yeah. You know, I mean, they can make career mode an unbalanced, unholy mess for all I care because I don't play it. Yeah, yeah. Now I say for all I care. I really do care because I don't want, I don't want people that play career mode to get stuck with a horrible game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I do care. I want everybody that wants to play this game, however they want to play it, I want them to be able to play it. Yeah. But my biggest gripe about this game is performance. Um, I about a year ago invested big bucks in a high-powered gaming laptop. This thing, there isn't a game out there that this game cannot, that this system cannot chew through. Uh, it runs Skyrim on the highest possible graphic settings. And yet, this very same laptop will chug on, on Kerbal Space Program sometimes. And it's because if I get, um, let's say that I get two ships close to each other and one ship has a 400 part count and the other one has a 500 part count, the game can start to chug. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, if I understand the way the game is addressing the hardware, I think in many cases it's ignoring a lot of the hardware that I have specifically to play games. Yeah. That is a gripe. It shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. It should utilize every bit of hardware I've got, which I mentioned Skyrim. Skyrim apparently grabs every bit of resources it can to run. And Skyrim on my laptop runs beautifully. And Skyrim is a huge open game. Yeah. So Kerbal should not run worse than Skyrim. 
if anything, Kerbal should like materialize in the real world on my laptop. <laughs> you know, it should be like a 3D yeah, holodeck you, game you don't, for me. You, yeah, you don't need that two hundred dollar, you know, the head thing, tracker thing. Yeah, you know, you just you're in it anyway. So, well, um, so I guess what we're we're one definite opinion from you and one very cautious opinion from me. And we would love to hear any opinions anyone has. Yeah. And so, as always, that is kerbalpodcast at gmail dot com, <laughs> and it may be our last episode ever and at kerbalcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to wrap up mission briefing and move on? Yeah, I think that I think that's it. Okay. Well, it's time to move into uh, a Kerbal life, uh, which of course Amy Kettlewell uh, gives us every week. We missed last week. Ironically, the episode Amy was on... Because she was busy. Because she was busy. Yeah. So we missed... So there's been a one-week gap. Can you tell us what happened in the last episode? I wasn't even here last week. All right, let me try. Let me try. <laughs> there were Kerbals, and one of them is, is back, and it's good, and there were donuts, and then... Uh, you know what? I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. And there is excitement in the streets of Kerbin today as Kerbals glue their eyes on the progress of Mooner 1 as it leaves Kerbin orbit. Will a Kerbal soon set foot on the Mun? What will we learn from the Mun? Is the Mun really edible? Stay tuned for updates. And in other news, fear sets in as one Kerbal accidentally stepped in a puddle. Mission Control to Mooner 1. You're approaching the Mun transfer window. Time acceleration off. Copy. Time acceleration off. Standby engine staging. What's the key for that again, MC? It's spacebar on my keyboard, Jeb. Spacebar ready. Full throttle on your command. Okay. Three, two, one. TMI engage. Hitting spacebar. Mission control, TMI engage. Full throttle, awaiting shutdown. Copy that, Mooner One. You're on your way. Shutdown on your command. Shutdown. Shutdown. Good job, Jeb. We have Mun Encounter. Now just sit back and enjoy the ride. Time acceleration, 50x. Time acceleration, 50x. Leader 1 to Mission Control, entering Mun Encounter. Copy that, Jeb. Time acceleration off. Time acceleration off. Stand by for retrograde burn. Full throttle. Standing by full throttle key. Approaching Mun peri... periapsis. What? Uh, uh, approaching Mun periapsis. Full throttle. Retrograde burn. Full throttle. Almost. Almost. Munner orbit achieved. We did it, everyone. Engine shut down. Jeb, you are now the first Kerbal in history to orbit the Mun. Just think, pretty soon you'll be setting foot down there and you can finally answer the age-old question. Which moon of Kerbin is the dessert? Oh, and by the way, now is probably a good time to tell you that you might not actually have enough fuel to get back from the moon. But, it, say again, MC? Don't worry, we have a plan. We're sending Bob up after you and Refueler 1 to top you off in lunar orbit. How's he gonna do that, MC? Well, he's gonna have to do a rendezvous and dock with you. Oh, copy that. Actually, what, what is that? Basically, we send him up, he lines up with you perfectly, and gently attaches his ship to yours. That sounds a little difficult, MC. Eh, people talk about it around here all the time. How hard can it be? Just remember my catchphrase. When you fail, have a donut. You aren't even trying with these anymore, are you? A Kerbal Life was written by Amy Kettlewell with music by Lee Rosevear. Jebediah Kerman and Kerbal Space Program were created by Squad. The game is available for purchase on Steam or KerbalSpaceProgram.com. I love that. Yeah. That is so funny. It's hard to do. I know. It's really hard to do. You know You know what, though? Bob's a, pro. A Kerbal Life has changed kind of the way I play the game. Uh-huh. Because I, I find myself, now I'll be playing the game, right? And I'll be, I mean, I'll be talking to myself. I'll be like, okay, you know, uh, prepare for transmuter injection. Yeah. You know, 10. Because I've got Kerbal Engineer installed. So uh -huh. it'll show me when, when, you know, it's time for staging and things. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, I'm like simulating radio conversations. Yeah. I paint myself green. You paint yourself green? Yeah. Oh, I don't. <laughs> why did I? I did not no, need that yeah. image. Thank you. Well, I just, I did, why did you do that? I don't. I don't know why. I'm going to be thinking about that yeah, for forever. It's my keyboard's green. No. Oh.
No. So we want to give out some thanks. Are you wearing clothes when you're green, please? <laughs> uh, I don't even know anymore. It's not it's like easy a, being green. Uh, no. Let's give out. Oh, but anyway, well, our, our first thanks we want to give out is Amy K. Amy K. Thank uh, you. Good job on A Kerbal Life. And, we and look forward good job to the next last one. week. Yeah, good job last and week. Just good, just good job. Yeah. Just good job. And also, so, thanks for continuing to speak to me even after last yeah, week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, who's on our list of thanks? Okay, we want to thank our listeners and regular contributors, including Amy K for A Kerbal Life and everyone who sends us letters and tweets. And we don't want to forget the moderators for the subreddits, Kerbal Space Program and Kerbal Academy. And music for A Kerbal Life provided by Lear... Uh, Lear. 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 There's a Lear jet making music for our... No. for the Okay, Lee Rosevere. Uh, R-O-S-E-V-E-R-E. Uh, you can find him at freemusicarchive.org forward slash music forward slash Lee underscore Rosevere. Episode music comes to us from Professor Soap. Look for him on Facebook or at professorsoap.com, profsoap.com. Yeah, Prof Soap. I, I was looking that up and I went, oh, it's Prof Soap because I was yeah. always going Professor Soap. Yeah, I always, I normally did uh, facebook.com slash Professor Soap because that's yeah. what he originally asked for. So. Right. But yeah, he's got his own site and yeah. he's got cool shirts. And also, a uh, big thank you to Ascalon. Uh, he posts episodes of Kerbalcast every week to YouTube, uh, so they are available. All of our episodes are there, uh, and you can, if you want, you can read them closed captioned, which yeah. is uh, which is even more enjoyable than the actual episodes themselves. Oh, by far. <laughs> If you would like to contact us, uh, very easy. Uh, our email address is kerbalpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kerbalcast and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Oh, and I wanted to, when we did our list of thank yous, uh, I, thank you so much to everyone who's leaving comments on iTunes. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, it's really nice to, when they pop up, I mean, makes my day. Yeah. So it's always nice. Uh, in addition to iTunes, all of our episodes are available there. You can also get them uh, on our website. It is kerbalpodcast.libsen.com. And if you want to see what we're up to or see what we're not up to, you can also find <laughs> us on Steam as Biff Aldrin and Nos Tromo. That is, when I'm playing, that is so cool to have like little windows will come up and it'll say, you know, so and so is playing Kerbal yeah, or whatever. Kerbal, yeah, Kerbal, Kerbal, Kerbal. Yeah. Or, or a lot of times, uh, you know, so, uh, I get a little chat window will pop up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, be like, so is Eve still spanking your bottom? Yeah. Like, yes. Uh. <laughs> it is. Well, anyway, that wraps it up for episode 36 of Kerbalcast, 50 Shades of Eve. Oh I am your, oh my, 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 my. I am your LMP, Lunar Module Pilot, Biff Aldrin, uh, back in the Command Module Pilot seat, our CMP. Nostromo. Until next time. Happy, happy Kerbling. Kerbling.